Jenny. I'm here today to do my November wrap up for 2021. Um, I had overall a pretty good reading month for nonfiction November. I did end up reading mostly nonfiction during the month of November and um, I explored some really interesting topics. My first read of November was Spirit Run by Noe Alvarez and this uh, book chronicles Noe's um, journey through kind of growing up, trying to find his place in the world, and he ends up run coming across this um, run that is organized uh, every four years and is specifically targeted towards indigenous peoples from across North America. And what it tries to do is to raise awareness about indigenous issues and culture and kind of bring um, self-empowerment to um, indigenous communities. And Noe kind of came across it while he was in college, feeling very out of place, feeling very disenfranchised after winning a scholarship and getting into school and going through quite a poverty-stricken um, childhood. Um, he was kind of at a loss when he got to university as to how to fit in and and when he came across this run he felt like this was some sort of a sign of something that he should do and so you follow that journey um it is a memoir and um it also peppers in different experiences from different um indigenous people that noe met meets along the way during his run um, it's 6,000 um, miles. It's a very intense, long run. Um, they do it um, without a lot of financial support, and so there isn't a ton of food for them or a lot of luxurious lodgings. This is very grassroots organized. Um, overall, I enjoyed learning about Noe's story and um, hearing about the different people that he encountered on this run. And, but the parts that really sang to me, the parts that I thought were the most well executed um, and were the most poignant were his descriptions of his mother and father's childhoods growing up in Mexico. And I felt that his ability to share his father's story in particular, which was very harrowing of growing up in extreme poverty and basically abandonment in Mexico, were very, very compelling and how hard his parents worked to be um, seasonal fruit workers in Washington state as he was growing up. Um, so, you know, that part was, was very well done. I found um, other parts of it to be a bit disjointed and a bit less engaging in in the writing style so overall um it's 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 a very interesting read and again super important for um you know hearing different types of voices with different types of experiences and i think noe's experience has a lot to say about um where people fit in in culture and like how finding that place and finding you know your your you know special reason for being in on this earth is not always that straightforward and there's many different reasons within that 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 can be the case especially when you're talking about um, systemic racism and and access not being equal for people that you know finding yourself is not like this straightforward path for anyone but especially if you're coming from a marginalized community the second audiobook that I listened to in November for Nonfiction November was The Barbizon by Pauline Bren. And this was uh, a very interesting look at the Barbizon Hotel in New York and its function as a place for women beginning in the 1920s when it was built through to, I believe, the late 80s um, or early 90s before it was converted completely into condominiums. Uh, so it's interesting because the hotel itself is only a portion of the story. Obviously, the women staying at the hotel was, was a huge part of the story, but also 
It's including, you know, a lot of the history of the architecture of New York in the 20th century and also the basically the history of Mademoiselle magazine because Mademoiselle had a um, standing arrangement with the Barbizon that their guest editors who would be college age women from across the United States would stay at the Barbizon during their month long internship. A lot of those women who did the internship be, turned out to be famous writers, actresses, Grace Kelly, Joan Didion, Sylvia Plath, etc. And so a lot of the book is about them, their experience there. Of course, I didn't know this before reading the book, but Sylvia Plath's novel, The Bell Jar, is actually about her time in New York at the Barbizon. And, and so she kind of took the characters, the people she was surrounded with, and made them into the characters for the novel and changed the name of the hotel, obviously, but it was based on her experiences there. So I found that the book really pivoted on Sylvia Plath, she became kind of the, the interior spoke that everything else moved around for a lot of the narrative as soon as she entered the story. And I think I understand why I understand, you know, the, the author's motivation for, you know, using Sylvia because she had, she obviously has a lot of writing done about her and she also wrote about the Barbizon itself. But I did feel like it was a bit of a Sylvia Plath show at times and everything would kind of relate back to her. And so I felt like the author relied on Sylvia Plath's experience a bit too much in, in explaining the overall history of the hotel. Um, and so that's one of my, my probably main problem with it. I did find it really interesting. There's lots of amazing women who lived at the Barbizon. Um, you also can kind of detail the history of feminism within the United States and like the way that women's lives and the views of women were changing during that time by reading this book because um, as those as the way women were approaching their lives changed, so did the function of the Barbazon itself as being this kind of sanctuary where it was only women and men, you know, were not allowed to stay there. It was a place for women to feel safe and for professional women to pursue careers at a time when women were being encouraged to do so. So it, it has a lot to offer as a book. Um, I think if you've read Red Comet, Sylvia Plath's, the huge biography that was released uh, about Sylvia Plath in 2020, which I have not read. But I think if you've read it, perhaps there is a section, I hope, in that thousand page uh, biography about the Barbizon. And so you might, if you have read it and then you read the Barbizon, you might find it a bit repetitive. I'm not sure. So if anyone has read both of them, please let me know. Um, if there was a lot included in there because one of the reasons that it's so pivotal for Sylvia Plath is because her first major breakdown and suicide attempt happened after she got home from her experience in New York at Mademoiselle and at the Barbizon. So yes, it, it's, it's quite looked at in the book, but um, overall there were a lot of interesting perspectives on women's history uh, in that book. The uh, next book I finished in November was Birth Strike by Jenny Brown. And this book uh, was a little bit different from what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to kind of detail the um, work that women do that is unpaid in the economy when they choose to be homemakers or still do even if they are working a job outside the home, they come home and do a lot of that work. And um, there's kind of that lack of, of equality within those relationships for a lot of women. Um, and that's not really what it focuses on. What this book is about is about population and how uh, women, especially in the United States, it very much focuses on the United States, but it uses studies from other countries to kind of contrast birth rates, but the birth rate in the United States is declining. And that is, in, in, in Jenny Brown's theory, that is due to the lack of access that women have to childcare, to maternity leave from their jobs, 
or parental leave from their jobs to quality health care to, um, you know, good education. Basically saying that women are choosing not to have children because they don't have access to services that would encourage them to have children. And that if you give women more access to these services and they know that they can take a year off their job without any penalty and have a child, that they're more likely to do so. And so um, there were a lot of excellent points made in this book. Um, there were a lot of really powerful statements about our value as a society and where we place our value. Even if someone chooses not to have children, they should feel engaged in the fact that um, other people are having children and that those children are going to be the workers of tomorrow. And so there's so many layers to the story, but I thought that Jenny Brown covered the information in a very um, succinct way. It's not a very long book. She uh, researched very well and she brought forth, you know, questions about access to healthcare, access to, to conscious, to birth control, all these things that are contributing to, um, the, the declining birth rate as, you know, things that need to be addressed in order to create a society of equals and then also in order to make sure that there are enough workers in the future to support the aging population that we currently have. So um, yeah, I, I would recommend it. I think that it's a work of, I, I think that it's something when people are talking about ep economics, they really don't understand that investing in certain social um, social supports for people is actually going to make the system run better in the future. It's not going to be a, um, a pull on the system where people are, you know, taking advantage. It's actually going to contribute to healthier people, better workers, more workers in the future. So check that out if you're interested in any sort of economic theory. Okay. Um, I finished two books for art-based purposes that I'm not really going to go into here today, but one of the ones that I will talk about is the Ruth Asawa biography, Everything She Touched, The Life of Ruth Asawa by Marilyn Chase. So I led a discussion of this book um, on the Artist Mother Network, and um, Ruth Asawa's life is absolutely fascinating. She came from um, a family, uh, her parents were direct immigrants from Japan and were they were interned during World War II. As a family, her father was actually separately kept by the FBI somewhere else and the family themselves were interred in Arkansas, I believe. And um, that experience definitely shaped Ruth's future um, she ended up going to the Black Mountain School in North Carolina, which is a very famous school run by Joseph Albers, among other artists, um, in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and she met her future husband there, husband there, Albert Lanier, and they um, eventually settled in the San Francisco area. And she, um, aside from making these amazing um, metal sculptures, which she developed after visiting Mexico and um, learning from some artisans there who made baskets. Um, she also was a fantastic um, organizer and um, community artist. She's made multiple um, public sculptures that are all around San Francisco. She also was instrumental in creating the um, a school for the arts, which is now named after her in San Francisco. So she also had a very large family. She had six children, uh, four that she gave birth to and two that she adopted. So she was a powerhouse of a woman. She, you know, walked her talk and, and lived a very rich and um, art-filled life and she shared that life with her family. It was all integrated to her. There was no separation um, between 
who she was as an artist and who she was as a mother and a wife and a, and a citizen of um, San Francisco. This book itself is actually really beautiful. There's a beaut like all of the photographs that are integrated into the book. Um, they're just done in a, in a stunning way. Um, and I really think that it's, it's, she's got a fascinating life. So if you're looking for someone to learn about, um, who didn't have a typical life, uh, I would definitely recommend, uh, reading this one. Um, I think that, you know, this is the, this is the, the wonderful thing about artist biographies is that you can really find some fascinating, inspiring people to learn about, um, if you're looking for a biography. I also read Rebecca during the month of November by Daphne du Maurier. That was my um, pleasurable uh, uh, fiction read. And I made a vlog about my experience reading Rebecca. So I will just link the vlog down below if you're interested in hearing my thoughts about the book. I definitely enjoyed it. I'm definitely on the likes Rebecca train, not the dislikes Rebecca train. So um, if you wanted to know, if you were waiting with bated breath to know where I fall in that, that's where I fall. And then I read or read part of um, Oreo by Fran Ross. And this book was part of my 1970s project. Um, and I will be doing a kind of wrap up of this project video. So I'll talk more about the books that were in the five for this session then. Um, but suffice it to say, this book did not work for me. Um, and I don't think it's because it's a bad book in any way. Um, I think it's because, and I said this in my TBR, that I was worried about it being humorous and I do not often get along well with books that are supposed to be humorous. Definitely struggled a bit with that. I did have a few times where I laughed, which means that, you know, the humor was, was good. Um, and I wasn't, I'm not putting down any part of this book because I just think that it's written for a very specific type of reader and I am not that reader. So this book is also mimicking um, Greek mythology. Um, it's a classic Odyssey story. And I'm also not a huge fan of that. Like that is just not something that floats my boat, I'll say. Um, and so for me, like that, the quest part of the story was interesting, but it wasn't enough to help to keep me reading. There was a bit of absurdist humor, um, and some kind of crass things, which don't bother me in books at all. Uh, but I just really couldn't get into it. Uh, I couldn't get behind the story or get connected to the characters and I really need that to to keep me going through a book. So I think that there's there is an audience for this and I did read the forward and afterward. The forward is by Danzi Senna and the afterward is by Harriet Mullen. And both of them were wonderful at um, describing the importance of this book and where it falls in African American lit history and where it falls in lit history in general and how important it is for what it did at the time. And so I really appreciated reading those essays and like understanding where this book falls in terms of, um, you know, taking, taking a different view of an African American experience and kind of, you know, pushing it forward and how a lot of writers like Fran Ross um, were kind of lost in the kind of fray of, you know, white supremacist culture where, you know, this type of a work that is so intelligent and has so many layers, um, just didn't reach its, its true, um, audience or didn't get the hype that it deserved at the time. And so I, I'm glad that I'm able to talk about this here. And I really hope that, um, if you do like kind of funny, irreverent, reading there is Fran Ross right there that you will check out this book and um because I know there are people who would love this and I it's just not me and I've you know I kind of had a feeling at the beginning that it might not be me but 
Regardless, if you like funny books, if you like Odyssey stories, try this one out. Okay, so that was my reading for November 2021. And overall, I would say it was a pretty good reading month. So I will be back again soon with another video. Thank you so much for watching.